the world has enough clothing. We don't need more. We need a lot less and we need to work a lot more slowly. Hi, we have with us today Iman Masmoudi from Tunic, who's talking to us all the way from Tunis in Tunisia. I mean, if people want to wear where that was. And I think it's, it's she's got some really interesting things that we want to explore, um, especially with regards to how how do you run a business? How do you run a business sustainably? How do you run a business um, close to sort of like the ethos of running a business with traditional communities, which I think for our our viewers, our audience here at Gen Meme, it's something that they are actually quite interested in. Go on. Would you care to just introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, my name is Iman. I'm the founder and president of Tunic, which is an ethical clothing cooperative in Tunisia. Uh, we work with uh, our traditional artisans all along the supply chain, from you know the shepherds whose uh, sheep we take the wool from to people who spin it into thread and weave into fabric and uh, cut and sew everything that's required to make clothes, which is actually very complex um, craft. And um, we work with a, a horizontal distributed production model. So all of the artisans own their own means of production. They're working from their homes and on their own schedules and they set their own prices. Um, so we're, we're basically trying to, I mean, I think a lot of people know the issues with fast fashion. On the one hand, um, you know, the environmental destruction and the treatment of workers. And then, you know, the opportunity that you were talking about of supporting artisans and traditional crafts so we really tried to bring those things together and try to offer a solution to both problems at the same time, if we can, um, and just bring our values to every part of the business. I Just to share a bit about my background, I um, just graduated from undergrad a few years ago in 2018. I studied um, social and political theory and Islamic history or history of the Muslim world. And then I did my master's also in Islamic history at the University of Cambridge um, just last year. Uh, so I really am not, I, I don't come to it from any business background or any fashion background or, uh, you know, never thought I would be an entrepreneur of any kind. Um, I'm more of just a historian and kind of political activist uh, type of person, but it's been really fun. I started this project with my mom and my sister a few years ago. It's just a family um, passion and it's, uh, it's grown a lot more than I ever imagined. So very grateful. Because you're a historian, so I'm just going to like throw everything, all of the buzzwords in as well, like colonialism and capitalism. Like how has it affected the sort of like the artisans and just the local economy? I don't want to go back to be like in the Ottoman period, you know, so I think it would Maybe it would be if I, I narrow it down, <laughs> so sort of like, yeah. um, I think with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Tunisia was a, there was a lot of interplay between the Ottomans and the French, the impulses between yeah. wanting to modernize the economy and whether people were ready to adopt, you know, new technologies, uh, new ways of doing things, and also just new rhythms, because as you mentioned, a lot of traditional uh, artisans, you know, they're not moving at, on mechanical time. It's in here, yeah. like the, the people that we spoke to here, they they call it um, almost like they're waiting for the angin, because they're waiting for the wind to come to strike them. <laughs> and then they'll do some work, you know? So which if, <laughs> if you're ordering a boat from a boat maker and you've got a, uh, like a schedule that you want to push off from, Maybe not the best idea, but that's basically um, how they approach work. Yeah, that's 100% true. And, um, you know, very, uh, just a, a much more human way to work. And that's one of the things that I admire is just that, you know, some, some of our artisans, for example, they, because it's a distributed model and they own the means of production, the balance of power is very even. I have no way of like forcing people to do anything. And it very often happens. The delays are a huge part of just something we come to accept. Um, and I value in a way, like just that, you know, one of our weavers can just say like, oh, my daughter's having a baby. So I'm going to go stay with her for the next three months. And I'm, I'm not available for, <laughs> you know, an entire quarter of the year or something. Um, you know, things come up in life and 
that lifestyle where people are just part of their local communities and work is you know a beautiful part of their lives that they love to do but it's, it's just always secondary um i think a lot of us wish that we could live like that and you know a lot of people really suffer from the nine to five or often in factories it's more like nine to nine um, work day and having no time with families and, ha and you know, um, you know, kids being, uh, you know, set, not raised by their parents, either of their parents and uh, just the isolation of families. And like the work is, has come to be like almost the entire purpose of society. Everything in society is going towards like producing more and more. Uh, so that rhythm of life is something um, you know, that, that I find beautiful and want, want to support. And I think is one of the biggest, uh, you know, values of working in this way, but yeah, in the, you know, in the Ottoman period, the tradition, you know, the pre French period in Tunisia, um, textiles were a huge part of local life, primarily wool. We can't grow cotton. Uh, we can't, we don't have linen and we don't have silkworms. <laughs> These are like the three other main natural fibers and they're amazing fibers and we don't have the environment for them here. So we mainly work with wool. We have very happy sheep. Um, and that has been like the history of traditional uh, craft in, in, in Tunisia when it comes to textiles has been in like weaving um, rugs and hats. So our traditional shishia hat, Tunisia used to supply like tens of thousands of those annually um, to the entire Ottoman empire. The traditional red kind of Ottoman hats those were all made in Tunisia, uh, okay. in particular in the 18th and 19th century and, the, and before that as well. Um, so this is one of those myths that people think like traditional crafts can't do things at scale because like only a factory can, can, can provide something at scale. And this is just not true. I mean, you can have hundreds and thousands of artisans um, they control their own means of production. They're working from their homes or from their own workshops or something, but that will still give you like tens of, tens of thousands of hats uh, annually, for example. Of course, it's not, it's, it's not as fast. And of course, it's not as uh, hyper-efficient, but um, we, you can do things at scale. Just because it's decentralized doesn't mean it can't um, create huge quantities and supply what people need. Uh, so yeah, that was a huge part of the Tunisian economy. Even in this one island off of the coast where a lot of our weavers work now in the south of Tunisia called Jirba. Jirba today has only like five or, le or four uh, weavers of fabric out of wool. Only a few decades ago, upwards of 70% of the, of the um, craftsmen and people on that island were weavers. And there's hundreds of thousands of people, by the way, on the island. So all of that work is gone now because of uh, the industrial model and because of colonization and those sorts of things. When it comes to the, the I'll give a brief, how to be brief, that's my problem. <laughs> when it comes to like the, so those, those were the important textiles in Tunisia. It's weaving, it's crochet and boiling and dyeing. Um, and also leather um, when it comes to textiles, right? There's also wood and, and metal work and other things that are outside of uh, the like clothing and rug space, fabric space. But it was a huge part of um, Tunisian artisans and craftsmen. French colonization, obviously there's a psychological effect to, col to colonization and an economic effect to colonization. Um, you know, the French seized a huge amount of property endowments that supported charitable endowments and schools and universities seized by the French, um, destroyed. Um, you know, that impoverishing of uh, the country is huge. And we know this has happened in so many uh, colonized countries, the extraction of resources and the centralization of, of land and power in the hands of the colonizers. Um, but there's also a psychological effect, of course, in terms of like, when you compare photos just from a few decades before and a few decades later, and you see the forms of dress that people are wearing, and you see what happens to the traditional articles of clothing. So all of those clothes that now Tunisians are being encouraged and psychologically enforced to, to dress like the French 
because of that feeling of um, inferiority. Uh, all of those clothes are imported. They're not being made in Tunisia. So you have this um, economic effect where people are actually importing clothes, buying clothes from their colonizer. And clothing is you know, a fundamental human need, right? There's, there's only a few things we need. We need shelter, food, water, and clothes to live. So this is a huge, huge industry anywhere you go. And if an entire population is uh, importing from their colonizer, <laughs> one of their basic necessities of life, that has an enormous economic effect, of course, on traditional crafts and the, text, the local textile uh, program. There was also forced industrialization from the French, so building factories that were actually owned by the French. And this is why I don't like the factory models because of the centralization of power, how it disempowers workers. Because workers don't own the means of production, they have no way to produce anything except to come to the factory and to the boss and to be entirely at their mercy, to accept whatever wages they offer, to work whatever schedule they ask them to work. And um, whatever task that they're given, basically. Yeah, and to have, you know, all of the profits skimmed off the top. Whereas with us, you know, our final price, usually around at least like 30% to 40% of the price of what we sold wow. is going directly into the hands of the artisans. If you look at the factory model, for example, of like industrially produced clothes, you might have less than 1% of that actually going to paying the workers. Um, so that is what happens when you have factories is the point of, you know, the way that that enriches the boss is that the boss is skimming off a huge percentage of the profits because they can set the wages really low and they can set the wages to have like no relation to what they're actually, the value that the workers are producing. Anyways, a, a long explanation to say that when the French build factories, there is, they're using, you know, Tunisians and North Africans as a form of cheap labor and extracting a huge amount of value from that. This is still happening all over the world. When we think about why, um, you know, for example, so many countries in the global south are manufacturing a huge amount of the world's products. You know, the amount of clothing that Bangladesh alone or India alone or Pakistan alone, Indonesia, I'm sure that te uh, textiles are a huge industry in Malaysia as well. They're providing the world's clothes. Is that making them hugely rich? Uh, no. And the reason, <laughs> like, I think it's obvious that no, the global wealth gap has only gotten larger over the last few decades. The richest countries have only gotten um, further away from the poorest countries of the world. And the reason for that is the factory model, the fact that like workers can be producing a huge amount of output and creating a huge amount of value and can get the smallest percentage of that. And then all that value that they created is actually going to you know, the Western corporations. And I don't say to the West, because there's actually a lot of poor communities in, in the US where I grew up or in Europe who are suffering from exactly the same extractive economic model. I know you asked a question about history, but- <laughs> No, I mean, it's like, <laughs> I, I think history is just something, I mean, we need to know our history so that we can understand what's going on in the present. Um, and because it's like, and I, I am a firm believer in sort of like just identifying patterns and a lot of things, you know, what we're talking about today um, yeah. have analogs in the past and probably the solutions to them are similar as like what you're trying to do with tunic, you know, sort of like, and, and I, 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 I like what you said about the, um, in a way, a lot of it is psychological, you know, the idea that, oh, you know, we can't do things without a centralized industrialized factories um but in actual fact that it is something that's been shown to be possible in the past you know you could produce at scale you could produce for the export for the global export market even though it's just uh, you know small groups working independently and you can meet your quotas and so so on and so forth um because um, i was reading through your ethics statement on on the website and i think there was something along the lines of like um we we're almost ashamed to admit that we're a what, for profit business uh, or organization. Um, but then you go on to say that uh, historically, trade has been the norm. Um, it's just the form that trade takes in, whether it's something that's extractive or something that you know kind of enriches uh, communities. I think there's something that you mentioned about how 
in the traditional souks in in Tunis, there is that culture of, in a way, if I make some money, I want to make sure that the person who's operating next to me also makes some money as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. No, I mean, this was something, I, it was actually a big struggle for me. I don't know if uh, anyone watching, it seems like they're probably already interested in entrepreneurship, so they might not experience this. But for me, I always grew up thinking, okay, so, you know, I want to be part of like solving problems of injustice. And I never, ever saw a business as a path to do that. Like it was either politics or, you know, um, writing and contributing to, um, you know, a political thought, or it was like char direct charity work for me that those are the options that were in my mind. And um, I think I've, uh, I'm still you know, changing those thoughts because they were very deeply ingrained in my mind that like business, the profit motive is corrupt. And I think that a lot of people have that perception because of the um, modern form of economics, exactly what you were saying about the extraction and the violence and the environmental destruction. You know, the way that we do business today, it's hard to see how that is of benefit to people. Um, you know, workers are on starvation wages, the rich get richer. Um, these types of models are, are very destructive to society. But at, on the other hand, as a historian, as someone who studies history, as I was saying before, undoubtedly, you know, exactly what you were saying, people have been trading and uh, across the world for thousands of years. Um, and uh, we know that uh, trade routes were extremely important, people going to market, traditional crafts, and just providing everything the world needs in every industry that you can imagine today. So um, I see it as something amazing and something that is like a blessing. Like when I come to, you know, when the artisan is able to sell something to a buyer where there was no relationship between those two people before, now they can come together and they can do something that's actually mutually beneficial. You know, it's not charity. It's not somebody giving something to somebody else where only one person is uh, benefiting in a material sense. Of course, there's like spiritual rewards from charity, but when it comes to business, both people benefit. That's the point of trading is that it's mutually beneficial and there should be no harm that comes to anyone from outside that. So, you know, you, you get to buy something beautiful that you really love or you really need and you're excited about and the artisan gets to create something that they loved creating and also, you know, be compensated for that labor. So, I, you know, now it's a no brainer to me. <laughs> But before it was definitely something I struggled with. And when it comes to, you know, traditional souks, it's not just Tunisia, it's, you know, that community ethic between traders where there's actually a lot of cooperation rather than, um, you know, the main ethic of the market being competition, which is what we're endlessly taught today. It is, yeah, there's competition. There's always that human impulse to excel and to, uh, you know, to just be excellent in everything that we try to do. And that effort is a good thing, but um, it's in balance with all of these other human values. So like one thing that, you know, people used to do, it's a dying practice, is that if you went early in the day to, you know, some, someone in the, the like wood area of the sulk or something, and you, you wanted to buy something, if they had already had a sale, they might send you to their neighbor and say, you know, the person next to me hasn't sold anything yet today. So that's, um, you know, that impulse of how trade can actually bring people together and build communities and create, you know, just beautiful societies. Um, that's how I think of it now. But it still is awkward, you know, just the idea of like selling something and asking for people's money. Uh, I haven't become fully comfortable with it, but I'm trying. Having said all that, how, how do you try to kind of like yeah. reconcile between these two streams, you know, between the, the reluctance and the awareness and also, you know, just making sure that it is something that, that's, that, that's worthwhile for you to continue doing? I draw a lot of inspiration from the artisans that we work with. I mean, when I see the things that they are able to create and that... And, and when I came to fully understand the amount of labor and skill that it takes, that really overcomes a lot of that discomfort because I can see like, no, this is something extremely valuable. And I sort of think of it like I'm just, 
you know, just like fighting on their behalf is like, no, I'm going to get you a fair price for this because this is amazing. And I, I, you, this should not be undersold. So that uh, distance where, you know, it's, I'm not selling something I made, I would probably be a lot shyer about that. Mm -hmm. um, but when I spend time with the artisans and I, and I intimately know how much work went into each of the items, uh, you know, I am just like the champion of those pieces. So how, how would you differentiate Tunic from other similar cooperatives or businesses that are trying to kind of make that bridge as well? Um, well, there's a few things. I, I don't want to, you know, uh, criticize any other um, uh, artisans co cooperatives or, or anyone working directly with craftspeople. I just think we have a little bit of different goals that we're trying to accomplish with our project. Um, so there's two things. I think a lot of artisans, a lot of artisanal cooperatives are really, really focused on supporting artisans and getting their craft out there as much as possible. And that is important to us, but I wouldn't say it's the number one priority. I would say the number one priority is um, our, our ethical values. So we are the um, only model that I've seen, and, I would, and I'm sure there might, may be more out there, but the only model that I've seen that is focused on the entire supply chain, a lot of artisanal cooperatives might be creating something by hand, but they'll still use like synthetic dyes or they'll still use, um, you know, polyester threads or, um, you know, whatever raw materials are available to them or are available on the market, um, they're, you know, using that in their handicrafts. And for us, it was important that every single raw material and every single step of the supply chain is happening in our cooperatives according to our standards and using organic materials that don't har don't harm the don't pollute the water or the air or the local environment. Um, and you know, it's a big privilege that we're able to do that. I think because we uh, we had the the time and the resources to to track that down that a lot of cooperatives don't have. And, and aren't able to do. So this is not meant to be a point of criticism, but it is just something that we are able to do and do focus heavily on. And the second thing being that we actually don't focus on creating uh, uh, really culturally reflective pieces, like really traditional items. Um, we try to design our own pieces, and I think we're getting better at this now, but we try to design our own items that Yes, they're handicrafts and they're made by hands, you know, of traditional artisans in North Africa, but they're not entirely like North African cultural pieces. Um, we hope that they're, you know, accessible to everyone, that anyone in the world could wear them in their local city and, you know, feel, feel comfortable and not feel like they look like uh, out of place or something. We, we do have some of those pieces, but we also try to because, you know, as I said before, we're trying to offer an alternative to really, you know, fast fashion and other companies. So I want people to be able to choose between like a tunic coat and a Zara coat or an H&M coat, um, you know, ASOS, like those companies. I'm, I'm really out to prove that there's a different way to produce that same type of clothing. Well, I would say it's higher quality clothing, but something that has the same look. So that's really different. I think most artisanal cooperatives are focusing on traditional crafts and traditionally looking items because it's about preserving the cultural tradition. And I think that's extremely valuable. Uh, that's just not our main goal, which is to you know, model that alternative that I'm talking about. So we have like you know, a blazer like this that is actually like a Western style blazer and has an Italian collar, for example. Um, this is not like, you wouldn't know that this came from Tunisia when you looked at it. Uh, and for me, that's because, you know, we're trying to get to like the Western prices, the prices that we have to charge in order to pay the artisans what I want to pay them is not something we can sell locally to Tunisians. So, I mean, some Tunisians, of course, but not to the majority of Tunisians. So those are the two ways is just, we don't actually sell, we don't focus on designing like traditional North African items. We try to appeal to a wider audience and we try to really focus on the entire supply chain and make it all organic materials and, uh, you know, non non toxic materials. The the fact that you're choosing to 
be very responsible and sustainable in how you kind of like conduct your business, uh, the the materials that you you employ, and how you organize your supply chain. Then, how do you kind of like make those costs make sense? You know, especially when you're trying to go against um, someone huge, because I mean they, or if I mean like because generally it's very easy to to manufacture something with you know, synthetic materials with synthetic dyes. Uh, and and it's like your costs are really low. You get like quite a huge profit that is actually something that you have to pay for, for the marketing, yada, 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 and all that. So you know, yeah. how do you approach that? Yeah, it's a really complicated question. So I'll probably, we'll probably have a, like a bit of a back and forth and try to answer it in multiple parts because I don't want to talk for 10 minutes straight or something, <laughs> but I'll try to... Um, I think there are challenges like that, but there are also opportunities with our model. There are also th- a lot of things that save us money. Um, I'll, that I'll, I'll start with those. So you know, we don't have, um, for example, minimum order quantities. When you deal with the industrial model, uh, a big barrier to entry is like you can't get anything from a factory unless you get like ten thousand units or something like that. So if you're starting really small, um, doing it at a small scale, we can make. Uh, 100 rugs, we can make 10 rugs, we can make one rug, and it doesn't change. Um, you know, there's no limitations on that. There are no overhead costs. All, all of the artisans are working from their homes. There's no factory. There's, um, you know, and those things come with a lot of cost. So all of the money we pay is just what we put into the hands of the artisans. And that allows us to give them the wages that we really want um, to give them. And that that they've asked for and that we sometimes try to go above even. So that's one opportunity. Um, you know, and another opportunity with how we do things in our supply chain is that everything is local, right? When you manufacture clothing at the industrial scale, you're getting your cotton from Egypt and then it's going China to be dyed and it's going to India to be woven into fabric and then Bangladesh to be cut and sewn. Like these are huge complex supply chains, all of that transportation and global shipping and all of those middlemen that are along that supply chain. That's another opportunity for us to lower costs when we do everything in-house and locally with local materials. Um, So those are two opportunities, but even with that, of course it costs us way more than um, what people make on the industrial scale, of course. And Um, there's a few ways that we deal with that. The most basic way is that to try to keep our prices low. And we could, by the way, I think if if we wanted to, we could, and this is what a lot of ethical clothing brands do is they sort of go luxury market and, um, you know, they want to have, their costs are higher, but they want to have the exact same profit margin as the fast fashion companies. So their clothes are just like, you know, a thousand dollars for, for, a pair of pants or something like that. We see that a lot. And we didn't want to do that. So for, for a variety of reasons. So um, our margins are just smaller, right? We just have a smaller profit margin per item. Um, that means we're, you know, we're not growing like Zara, you know, they, they'll charge, they'll charge you impossibly low prices for something but they're actually still making a huge margin. They're making like 90% profit on that or more. They charge 10 times or 15, 20 times the um, production cost, including the shipping and packaging and everything. Um, We don't, to say the least, we don't make that much per piece. You know, our profit margins can range from like 50% to um, as low as, sorry for the traffic, as low as uh, 25%. That is fine for us. I think that's pretty respectable in any other industry, like other businesses would be pretty happy with um, those types of profit margins. But in fashion, it's pretty low. It's considered pretty low because that profit quickly gets eaten up by other things in fashion. You know, uh, these big corporations, the clothes that they produce annually, they might actually only sell half of that. They might have like 50% unsold stock because they're constantly producing more than anyone could possibly wear or more than the world needs, uh, that overproduction, that speed that's been built into their model quickly eats away at some of their profit just because they're wasting so much. 
again, you already mentioned the marketing budgets and things like that, that we don't have and that we don't pay for. Um, so their, their margins do get eaten up quickly by a variety of costs. And we are pretty, pretty lean, I would say, you know, when we do a photo shoot, we don't have like 20 people on set um, doing, you know, makeup and hair, we don't even show faces or hair in our photos. Like those are things that we don't do because they save money, but they actually do save money at the end of the day. Um, sometimes those choices that you make just to follow your values and your ethics end up being, you know, the leanest and most affordable way to do something. So those types of things do add up and they allow us to, I think, have a sustainable business model that it has a very um, respectable profit margin, but it's not, it's nowhere near, you know, the 80% or 70% growth that indie techs and some of these big corporations might be getting annually. So we're just not growing as fast, but it, it is a very um, uh, reasonable, I think, and, and you know, fair amount of profit for a business to be making. Would you try to kind of like compete in the same um, cycles as well? Because I mean, I think, uh, especially so in the Western hemisphere, you know, there's like seasonal fashion. And yeah. is that something that you feel that you need to follow? Or is that, is that, do you have a different approach to that as well? No, not at all. I do not follow that at all. I don't think it would be possible, but I also don't want to, um, just because of the waste that I was talking about. I mean, we, we produce annually like over a hundred billion garments, new garments from new fibers for a planet of only 7 billion people. And within a year, 50 billion of those new articles of clothing are in the trash or in landfills or destroyed or uh, in the secondhand market. So the world has enough clothing. We don't need more. We need a lot less and we need to work a lot more slowly. Um, and so I'm very happy for us to take our time and to release like one collection a year, uh, you know, and that goes into our design. It's not just like a schedule of, of when to put out the next things, but we're obviously, we, we're not keeping up with trends and we're not designing for trends. We're trying to design for classic uh, pieces that will last a long time in their material and in how they look. So, you know, when we create designs like for the women's collection, we were looking for inspiration through um, catalogs of classic pieces from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s and trying to blend elements and trying to create things that are not, you know, the hottest coat look of the season, but are just beautiful and something that will be wearable for decades. Hopefully. Something that's a bit more timeless and, you know, it's like 50 years down the line is still something that looks, I don't know, fresh maybe? Yeah, yeah. So hopefully very fresh. And it's never going to be like, this is the, you know, this is the code of the season. Like this season, everyone's wearing oversized collars. Next season, everyone's wearing bell sleeves or something like that. It's never going to be that. Um, and I don't think that's what, you know, clothing should be. Uh, like we know that that's a very destructive cycle, both uh, environmentally and also just for our peace of mind, like how it affects your mental health and stability to constantly be wanting new things and the addiction to uh, constantly buying and switching out your wardrobe every week even. So, you know, fast fashion companies, they work on like a new collection every week model. They release 52 collections a week. Mm -hmm. That's insane. I mean, 52 collections a year. The amount of time it takes to design an article of clothing, like this is a really complex piece. You know, it, it, it looks it's very simple, but it involves like actually <laughs> a lot of like engineer decisions and uh, it takes money. I, mean, I couldn't imagine putting out a collection from start to finish in less than the, the fastest I would be able to do it is maybe nine months from start to finish and having production at the end. So these things take time. I don't know how they do it. Uh, I don't think it's good. And I think a lot of a lot of similar like ethical clothing companies are moving away from that type of like constantly releasing new designs idea and just being much more intentional and careful about that. I want to continue on that thread, but I think I can hear my colleagues 
screaming <laughs> to me if I don't ask you the next question. Um, you mentioned that you designed um, more contemporary, uh, and if I'm correct, like, like modest wear uh, looking, which is a huge market internationally. And I think even the big players, you know, Zara's, the Zara's of the world, um, even the huge um, fashion houses, I mean, they're looking into that area. So it's a huge market. Like, but just from the design front, do you think you take, I mean, how do you imbue like that kind of, is there like a North African Tunisian design language or sense that you kind of like, you know, just try to influence just bits and pieces, just how to just to make sure that it doesn't lose its character? I would say we're still experimenting with that. We've tried a few different things. Um, we've definitely had, I mean, if you look at the, our first original collection we ever put, we ever put out, which actually was actually for men in, um, in um, summer of 2019, uh, which I think we could improve a lot on. That collection, if you look at it immediately, it looks like much more Arab and North African. Um, you know, there's classic design elements that we brought in, like a low cut V-neck, certain types of embroidery on sleeves, things like that. We preserve those, but we try to just uh, modernize the silhouette a little bit, make it something maybe a little more, you know, flattering on the shoulders, fitted shoulders or things like that. With the new collection for women uh, that we just released um, a few months ago, I think we took a much more subtle approach, but we still have those things like we have this coat that if you were to look at it from far away I don't think you'd notice but if you come closer the buttons are um, handmade copper buttons that have engraving on them uh, for example so the overall look kind of from far away is going to be something really widely appealing and it's not going to give the impression that you're wearing a cultural um, traditional outfit from North Africa but you know we gotta put we gotta put those things in we have to and i mean from just from the soul of like being a woman looking for modest clothes and uh all of the women that i talk to and know so you know like we we very much know what the challenges are and we know what types of pieces we regularly need that we have trouble finding um you know what types of things we constantly look for and aren't able to find that's what i tried to do with the latest women's collection just like a good work blazer, but a little bit longer <laughs> than normal, or like a good pencil skirt that doesn't have a slit on the side. Um, and so you, you have to think about solutions to that because you have this long skirt that's not wide at the bottom. The reason they add a slit is because you need that in order to be able to walk. Otherwise you'll have too narrow of a space at the bottom. So what we did is we had to create some hidden pleats in the back. Mm that will expand when you walk um, so that you can still have that same silhouette of a pencil skirt. It's kind of like really small, you know, engineering design solutions that give you uh, the practical way to get around the sort of, I guess you could say the like less modest alternative with slits and things like that. Um, so that's how we think about designing more modest pieces is they, they still look overall kind of the same, you know, uh, a lot of women aren't looking to stand out um, too much or to, to, to look strange or out of place. You want to have the same style, but just, you know, a few personal adjustments. For obvious reasons, those are actually things that I know of or uh, realize. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, because I think for, for a lot of people, especially if they're not, um, if they don't seek it, uh, and this is definitely true for me because, um, because like, I know, like people like my mother, my sister, when they look for modest wear, it's I, I would think it's just you know things that are looser, uh, things that are you know not as transparent, things like that. So I and I I didn't I, I wasn't aware that you know you had to think about more of the 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 practical aspects of it. Can you walk in this? You know, can you breathe through this and things like that. Okay, I mean, thanks for letting me know about that. It's like, <laughs> makes, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit that I didn't know. Um, oh, no, not at all. It's, just, it's not as simple as it sounds. It sounds simple, but there are some, some issues you have to figure out. I mean, another thing that you guys are quite firm about, at least based on the website, is uh, on marketing. So you, you're very firm on not spending, not spending a cent on marketing. 
<laughs> and uh, which I find interesting because I'm I'm kind of I mean I come from a PR background, so it's like you know why why no marketing? <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 also understandable because you know it's just a constant, uh, you know you're just pushing people's drives and desires like oh I get this new thing get get that new thing. In some way, promotions are are effect of life, and yeah. Then how how do you kind of like generate that interest and customers yeah yeah i mean let me share first a little bit about my thinking around that um because you know on the one hand and i was just saying before how this is a mutual should be a mutually beneficial transaction but i do ultimately believe that we're sharing something that's beneficial to customers if they want to get it it'll be something that's like good for their lives and it'll benefit their lives um so I guess I wouldn't say that sharing that invitation is inherently something bad to do. I think it can be actually, you know, a good and well-intentioned thing. And, you know, people need clothes and people are often looking for ethical clothing alternatives and how do they find you? The, the thing, the, the reason that our, our main ban is on social media ads um, and uh, any other form of marketing that is uh, basically doesn't have an opt-in element. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking to share the message with people who are looking to hear the message, basically. I don't want to um, show up in front of people who don't wanna, <laughs> don't wanna hear it, don't wanna see it. Uh, and I, that's important to me because I think the constant, you were talking about it and I completely agree, the constant bombardment of just like, you need this, you need this. And we have no choice about that. And we go on social media to like, see what our friends are up to and what our friends are doing. And we just get ads and it, and it affects the subconscious. We know that so many studies have been done. Um, I just don't wanna be part of that because I think it's a harmful industry, particularly the social media industry. I think that should be our community and social space. And the fact that the market in the modern capitalist system, the market just pervades every aspect of life and expands to encompass everything we possibly do. There's no escape. You can't find a refuge anywhere from you know, the market and the constant advertisements. I, I want to be part of modeling the idea that there should be some kind of safe spaces away from being sold things all the time. Um, so that that's the thinking. It's not just that like selling things. It's not that selling things and inviting people to buy um, is this inherently evil thing. It obviously is a necessary thing and can be a good thing. Um, it's just about where and what I'm looking for is opportunities where I can share the message in a space that people have come to expecting to be um, sold to or to be marketed to or to hear a certain kind of message. So I think like, you know, um, uh, trade shows and conventions, those types of things, like that obviously is a form of marketing. And those are great because people obviously go to, for example, the London Muslim Shopping Fest where we went in 2019. People go to that obviously looking to shop. And for me, that's an opt-in, like that's a choice they've made. They're looking to buy stuff. So I feel perfectly comfortable with something like that. Um, a lot of our growth has been through kind of organic things. We did a launch good. We're still doing our launch good campaign, our fundraising campaign, where if people want to donate and support the project, they do so and they share it with their friends. Again, that's an opt-in to me because it's people, I haven't paid for any ads for that. It's people sharing because they care and they're telling their friends because they want to invite them to this thing. And that's an organic kind of part of social life. So that's how I think about it. Um, those are a few ways that we get the message out. You know, trade shows, organic growth, trying to get people to tell their friends and family if they want to. Uh, I think other ways are, you know, obviously getting like in boutiques or in, in stores where people are walking in physically in person. This is all obviously so not Corona friendly, but uh, which has been a huge challenge. But uh, I think- As long as there's are, ventilation. Like, Yes. <laughs> yeah, as long as there's ventilation and masks and everything. But um, yeah, those are things that are really good. We also release a journal 
this isn't a marketing technique, but it, it, it obviously does spread the word about Tunic, which is that we really wanted our website, like we just did, didn't want to just create another shop out there where people are just buying stuff kind of passively. We wanted to create a form of engagement. And we had the idea from the beginning that if someone comes to the website, whether or not they buy anything doesn't, doesn't really matter that much at the end of the day. If they don't buy something, I would still want to make them think a little bit uh, and, and, and share some, some knowledge and share some thought around like what is happening in our global economy? What are the ways that we can change that? How can we think together and come together and try to create more um, ethical businesses and try to create solutions? So we published a journal called the Oasis Journal. Uh, you know, people submit articles on different um, topics around uh, reforming or restructuring or overthrowing the capitalist system. People come from different perspectives and share their, their theories and their vision and their values and their research and their poetry and art, things like that. And of course the journal, like we, we, we fund everything, all of the costs related to the journal. And, you know, of course, if people read it and if they get to the end, there's usually a little blurb about Tunic and that's another mm -hmm. way that, um, you know, we share, we share the, uh, the message out there. Uh, just, so, just that like you know, small it, hook, just get your claws in. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I think that's another thing where people are opting in because they, they're showing, I care about this. I care about these values because I'm downloading this journal or I'm reading this article or something. And, you know, we'll keep it at the bottom or if they get there, if they're interested enough to get there, then they'll, they'll get it. Um, but yeah, it's really important to me to just not shove things down people's throats who aren't looking for that, who aren't hungry. You know, I'm not trying to feed people who aren't hungry. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's how I think about this, this topic. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. There's still a lot that I think we could talk about, but I, I should cut. <laughs> the the interview uh because we've gone um i mean we, we haven't gone too much beyond time but uh i don't want to take any more of your time you've been so generous with your time with this um any any final comments how, can, can you tell us like where we can find find out more about you or tunic oh yeah i mean we're on we're on uh, all socials at tunic underscore official at, on instagram and twitter um we do a lot of events. We love to host events on, on like live talks on Instagram or host events on Clubhouse. Has Clubhouse come to Malaysia? Unfortunately, so yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a difficult space to navigate, but it can sometimes um, provide a really good uh, a platform for people to have good discussions. Um, so, so we're on there as well. Our website is tunic. Tunic with a Q at the end, by the way, <laughs> um, dot co dot UK or tunicoasis.com. They both go to the same URL. Um, I'd be so happy to hear from anybody who has thoughts or disagrees with anything I said. So I don't know if you can like put my email in a description of when you put something out or something, but I would just love to hear from people because I think what, what we're working on, what we're trying to solve, it's not unique to Tunisia. Uh, this is a problem everywhere in the world. I mean, you were talking about Malaysian artisans and what's happening to their craft and the de devaluing of their crafts in, in Malaysia. It happens everywhere in the world. Um, and, it, you know, it's, a, it's really a global struggle and it's going to require a lot of work. I don't think, you know, we're there. I think the model we're doing, I'm really proud of it, but I don't think like our little cooperative is going to, you know, save the world and save, save the planet. So I, I, you know, would just encourage people to think about what they can do on the production side. There's often a lot of focus on how can we ethically consume. And, you know, we need to think about like, we can't really, so often we can't control what comes to the market in, in a capitalist system. As consumers, we don't have much power. How can we become producers? That, that would be kind of the, the call to action that I would love to give people. Um, and yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. No worries. So what do you think? Will profits always win out over sustainability and being socially responsible? Tell us in the comments and don't forget to get in touch with Iman through her details in the description below. That's all from me, Lufi Hakim, for Jan Meme. See you next time.